Hello and welcome to The Reboot. This is a new series from the Tax Justice Network where we're going to talk about how to fix our broken economies. We're going to try and stay focused on solutions rather than problems. I'm Naomi Fowler. I'm the host and producer of the TaxCast, the Tax Justice Network's monthly podcast. You can find us on most podcast platforms. And I'm going to be talking to John Christensen and Nick Shackson of the Tax Justice Network. We're all speaking to you from lockdown at the moment because of the coronavirus crisis. And we're seeing governments around the world implementing all sorts of unprecedented policies that were unthinkable just a few weeks earlier. And um, of course, we face an even greater crisis in many ways, and that's the climate emergency. And so in this episode, we're going to talk about the green transition and how to finance it. So let's start with you, John. Um, how doable is the transition to renewable energy? I mean, are we technologically ready? Uh, technologically, things have moved on enormously in the last 10 years. But the first thing to note is the energy market sits right at the heart of a complex global economy and energy supply depends upon this vast global network of infrastructure which delivers energy from source to the workplaces and households which use the energy. Now on the fossil fuel side, this energy uh, infrastructure includes production platforms, oil wells, pipelines, ships, terminals, refineries, huge storage facilities. But on top of that, you also have vast numbers of coal and gas-fired power stations which generate the electricity which we use across the world. Now, what we've seen in the past two decades is, is a, a degree of catch-up as investment has been flowing into the infrastructure for renewables. So we're, we've seen many more wind turbine uh, fields being uh, laid out. We've seen growth of solar power, power hydropower, biomass generation, and in some countries, this investment has reached the stage where renewables produce the majority of energy demand. Uh, Iceland, for example, now has sufficient geothermal and hydroelectric capacity to meet its needs um, for electricity and for home heating. Uh, Uruguay has invested massively in solar and wind generation and is close to meeting its energy demand from those sources. If we look at the bigger economies, China, United States, Germany, Britain, France, we've also seen a, a, a vast increase in um, uh, renewable production and investment in the infrastructure for renewable production. Um, and, and the prices, have, the costs have come down relative to fossil fuel. We've reached the stage now, I think, where investment in fossil fuels is no longer attractive without massive amounts of subsidy from central governments. The coronavirus pandemic has hit oil producers really hard. Um, demand has fallen across almost all countries in the world, and the current average price per barrel is $19, which is way below production costs for almost all wells. Uh, this will probably tip the balance even further towards investment in renewables. And the former governor of the Bank of England sees all sorts of opportunities with the green transition. And he says, and I'm quoting, this will turn an existential risk into the greatest commercial opportunity of our times. <laughs> so, Nick, how do we stop big energy companies, the usual suspects, from monopolising these new energy markets? There's certainly going to be some people making an awful lot of money about, out of this. Uh, it depends who they are. I think people have this idea that this is potentially technologically a very decentralized technology. You can have solar panels and wind farms all over the place and break the power of the big uh, energy utilities. But in fact, there's a big danger here, and that is monopoly. Uh, imagine uh, a couple of large companies, maybe it's Google or HSBC or Exxon or Blackstone, buying up all the wind and solar farms out there, achieving what's called horizontal integration, so there's no competition. They can start raising prices to consumer. Then they go for what's called vertical integration. They buy the transmission and the storage infrastructure. They buy up the patents, they buy up the suppliers, the climate tech companies, and so on. 
then they can use that as, to control markets. They build these choke points and they can throttle the markets and suck out enormous profits and return those to shareholders instead of innovating or reinvesting and employing people. It also gives them enormous power over government, governments, um, forcing them to provide more and more public subsidy. And so the big danger here is that this happens, monopoly creeps up on this whole climate business and people start feeling really angry, start feeling hard done by, they're getting screwed. Um, and that's the sort of thing that feeds popular anger, feeds demagogues, feeds uh, people who say climate, is, climate change is a hoax. And this is a great danger to this whole process. So the solutions are pretty simple. We need to wake up to antitrust and anti-monopoly. Uh, nearly everyone in Europe is asleep on this. They think, we think that, you know, that our competition authorities are, have got this problem under control. Absolutely not. They're absolutely captured by the, by the large monopolies. We need um, to completely transform things. Thankfully, there is a thrilling new antitrust movement now emerging in the United States, creating a whole new way of looking at this. And it's having enormous influence over there. And we need to move in this direction urgently, fast. Um, this is just as big as the fight against tax havens, um, but we need to start understanding what's going on and start putting in place remedies to stop this. John, let's talk about subsidies for a minute because governments around the world are still subsidizing fossil fuels massively. The UK is the biggest in Europe for fossil fuel subsidies. In the United States, they spend more on fossil fuel subsidies than they do on defence, which is quite staggering. And apparently, if we were to redirect just 10% of those subsidies, we could have the most incredible green energy revolution. Look, fossil fuels have been at the heart of the global economy. They've driven the global economy now for close for over two centuries. Um, uh, in some respect, we can call this the hydrocarbon era. Uh, and, and politicians have historically considered coal, oil and gas as key industries. Um, now, since the major oil crisis of the 1970s, governments have seen it as a strategic imperative to support new oil and gas explora exploration and development, um, and especially when the investment is focused in really high de demanding environments, high cost environments like offshore Brazil or offshore Angola or in the Gulf of Mexico or even in the North Sea. Uh, uh, investments which have involved billions of dollars spent over the course of decades. Uh, but that doesn't explain why governments have been so reluctant to finance alternatives to fossil fuels, which have been around for a long time. And I think it's fair to say that over the past half century, there's been a failure, a political failure, to adequately support the development of alternative energy sources, especially wind and solar power. And to make matters worse, there's been a shocking failure to tackle the problem of energy wastage, for example, by improving household insulation and upgrading public transport. And I think this failure to, uh, re re to promote renewable energies is caused by the political power of the big oil and coal companies. Uh, look, for example, at the Trump administration, uh, which has a clear political bias towards fossil fuels, especially coal. So fossil fuel subsidies have shaped a global, I should say misshaped, a global market that is largely skewed towards fossil fuel suppliers. The, the International Monetary Fund estimates the cost of these subsidies at around 5.2 trillion US dollars a year, which means that until very recently, investors have been pouring money into new exploration and development of oil fields because their profits have been underpinned by subsidies. Uh, the gas fracking industry in the United States is an example of how subsidies have been thrown at businesses which would otherwise be totally unprofitable, and most of them are completely unprofitable now. The G20 countries have committed to phasing out all fossil fuel subsidies, but they haven't so far committed to a timeline for doing this. Nonetheless, investors can see the direction of travel, and with oil prices tumbling to below production costs, they can see the writing is on the wall now for fossil fuels. Yes, rigged markets left, right and centre. Um, Nick, what does transition mean for a country like Angola? which relies almost entirely on oil and gas and diamonds for its export earnings. 
So there's all this money coming into Angola, but in fact, it only benefits a minority of the population. There's about 300 families that really control the Angolan economy and get the lion's share of that wealth. And of the rest, most of it goes to uh, about a half a million, maybe a bit more people in the capital of Luanda, out of a national population of 30 million. So it's a small minority. The rest of the people predominantly involved in agriculture have been damaged by all this oil revenue coming in. And because it is subsidized imports, imports of food, and it's squeezed out their, their ability to, to sell crops. So it has made effectively them poorer. So potentially the climate transition by squeezing oil out will benefit the large majority of the populations of places like Angola or Nigeria, um, where new opportunities will emerge. And particularly if states start subsidizing ultra low cost energy, solar panels in particular, and allowing really poor people to buy effectively free energy, then there could be a really big benefit. And Nick, how do we pay for it? That's the big question in everybody's mind. We've got, on the one hand, governments with strong currencies and independent central banks that can create money, but that's not an option for most countries, is it? Well, there's various options. Um, one, we can pay for this transition, this gigantic transition used in carbon revenues, carbon taxes or, or, and so on. But the problem with that is that, you know, as the Gilets jaunes protests in France have shown, shown us politically, it's very difficult. Um, we can also pay using higher general tax revenues, just raise taxes, but at, at a time of economic crisis as we have now, it's a very difficult proposition. Maybe you can get some of that back with, with higher wealth taxes and you should um, excess profits taxes on corporations and so on. But this isn't gonna um, provide all the financing we need. Another option that the World Bank and others are very keen on is to outsource the financing of this to the private sector. And there's a lot of people licking their lips at this prospect. The trouble with this is that the private sector, first of all, is much more expensive source of financing than if governments do it. And also the private sector wants to shift all the risks onto the shoulders of governments and taxpayers and take all the profits for itself. So this is potentially a very, very risky, expensive and dangerous route that could discredit the whole process. Um, the last option and the best option is to get states to pay for it, either through straight government borrowing or through printing money, as the central banks have been doing for a long time, and pay for the climate transition. That is cheaper, but it's also more democratically accountable. So this is, that is the way forward. We must not listen to the siren song of the financial sector saying we can take this job off your hands because that is a route to discrediting the whole process. John, how do we avoid a gilet jaune type situation that we saw in France where people objected strongly to being forced to pay for this big change that's so needed? And uh, one of the protesters said at the time, I think you're worried about climate, I'm worried about next month. Uh, so how can green, how can the Green New Deal help ordinary people and not end up punishing them? Look, when, when President Macron hiked the fuel prices in France in the autumn of 2018, he actually provided a masterclass, a political masterclass, how not to implement pro-environmental changes. Uh, what he did at the time was he raised the cost of living for struggling workers. And at the same time, he lowered wealth taxes on rich people. So it's hardly surprising that the French people en masse pushed back against policies that were clearly that unfair. Look, once we tackled the immediate threat of the COVID-19 crisis, we need to do three things. First, we need to reboot the global economy to get workers back to work. Second, we need to take urgent steps to tackle the climate crisis. And third, we need to take, again, urgent steps to reduce the appalling levels of inequality that built up since the 1970s when we saw the start of the neoliberal revolution, the political revolution that reshaped the entire world. So if a Green New Deal is to be effective in tackling these three objectives, it needs to ensure that working people and vulnerable households benefit from the change. So the emphasis must be on ensuring high quality, well-paid jobs, a tax system that encourages investment in renewables and public transport and better quality housing, um, and which discourages, we need a tax system which discourages the growth of speculative trading and monopoly power. 
Now, alongside that, we need improved social and environmental protections, less emphasis on flexible labor markets, which have left millions of people vulnerable uh, to bad pay and bad employment practices. In other words, a Green New Deal needs to put ordinary working people at the, at the core of the deal. Now, too often, I think the environmental movement has disregarded the needs of low paid workers and vulnerable people. Their interests must be given the highest priority if the Green New Deal is to succeed. OK, thanks, John, and thanks, Nick. That's it for now from The Reboot. Thanks for joining us. In the next episode of The Reboot, we're going to be talking about how governments are paying for the coronavirus crisis. Where's the money coming from? How do we afford it? Uh, and what about poorer countries? What do they do? So we'll see you next time.